Next, the invaders in color. David Vincent has seen them. For him, it began one lost night on a lonely country road looking for a shortcut that he never found. It began with the landing of a craft from another galaxy. Now, David Vincent knows that the invaders are here, that they have taken human form. Some... Hey everyone and welcome to the broadcast. Those are just a few clips from the first episode of The Invaders. Uh, the episode was called Beachhead and it aired in 1967. Uh, quite a long time ago at this point. Uh, I guess it's been about, uh, how many years is that? I can't even, I can't even count how many years. Let's see, 67, so that means like 33 plus 20, 55 years ago? I don't know, something like that. Anyway, when I watch that episode, and I just watched it again recently, I still get chills when I see images of that flying saucer in the in the opening scene. Uh, I'm I'm not sure what kind of effects they did on that. I know they they uh, created that ship out of different images of actual real real UFO sightings, but uh, the image themselves, uh, the special effects, just to me for 1960s technology uh, without CGI. I think they did a great job on that. And there's something about this show, to me anyway, that really, uh, I don't know, it, it causes a lot different feelings than the other science fiction shows that were on at the time. Like you had Star Trek and, uh, you know, you had Lost in Space, but those were different kinds of shows, exploration, uh, humor in the case of Lost in Space, along with adventure, of course. But uh, but the, with the invaders, it was something different. There was a paranoia, there was a fear, there was it was tangible. It was like this could actually happen. Uh, it was it was you know it was firmly rooted on planet Earth. So you weren't in outer space or anything, but you had aliens coming to Earth to take over our world. Uh, because they had, they're they're coming from a dying world, and they look just like us. They, you know, they went into their energy tubes, and they changed their form, and they had to re-energize every so often, or else they would disintegrate. And every time, <clears throat> every time they disintegrated, of course, they would glow red, and they would disappear. So, um, to me, the Invaders was was the ultimate in paranoia science fiction. You know, the possibility that this could really be happening. And it inspired shows like, well, you see my cap here, The X-Files. Uh, that type of show, The X-Files, V, there are probably several other alien invasion shows that were inspired by the invaders. And Roy Thinnes himself, although, he, you know, a lot of people thought he was a little distant, I thought he was great in the role. And at the time, Roy was only in his 20s, which it, he made it seem like he was, he was a more mature type person. And uh, he even came back later on in, in the, uh, the 95 miniseries, which starred Scott Bakula. Uh, if you guys haven't seen my recent video, I'll leave a link in the, uh, in the description below so you can check it out. It gives you a lot more information on the, uh, you know, the actual two-season series of the invaders it only lasted two seasons unfortunately um i think it probably ended it was probably good the, you know when it ended because it was starting to kind of go down the rabbit hole it was getting away from a lot of the things that made the show great in the first season 
but you know that's that's a subject that's uh, that's subjective basically uh, i can still watch the show today though and and it's still gripping it still has that feel to it um you know it's that like if you ever watch the other quinn martin productions like the fugitive for instance they all had the same kind of structure there were four parts a lot of times they would they'd start with a cold opening where they give you a little bit of the action in the beginning to kind of hook you in. And then you get the four parts and, you know, that's how the basic structure went until you got to the fourth part and you got the resolution of the story. But the stories themselves, I, I thought that's what really, more than anything else, obviously the effects weren't that great, but they were effective. And, um, you know, for the time, again... I would like to see a show like this done today with today's special effects. But you have to keep good storylines. You have to have a good storyline or else there's no point. A lot of today's TV, I find at least, just lacks, you know, it, it lacks the story. You know, it, it lacks good characters and good story. Um, I mean, with exception, of course, there are things like House of the Dragon that, that are really well done. And things like Breaking Bad, that was great. You know, they had great storylines. They had, uh, you know, great showrunners who really kept to a certain theme and, and kept the story going over a period of time. But a lot of the stuff today, you know, including the movies that are coming out, it just seems like they're special effects heavy. And a lot of times the special effects aren't even that great. The CGI isn't that great. It's like it's rushed. And like, there's so much coming out now that they... Uh, the special effects department, the CGI department doesn't have a chance to really, you know, put everything into it. I mean, they do their best. You know, I, I'm sure that they're working hard. They're probably working overtime. They're probably not getting paid enough. And, uh, you know, and they're under extreme deadlines. But back in the 60s, they also were, you know, worked very hard and were underpaid and worked under deadlines. But, you know, it, it wasn't, as as special effects heavy it was more or less done to support the story so when you had things like the the aliens disintegrating you know it basically was just a, a shot where it, it would become a still shot where the person whoever it was would just freeze in place and then they would do an, an overlay a red overlay until you know the the person the alien disappeared and uh, even though it was you know very low uh, special effects it was still very effective for the time and as uh let's see i was 13 years old at the time the invaders came on and i think that had more of an effect on me than even shows like the outer limits which were more like a horror anthology this was something where you could follow a character the main character david vincent played by the great roy thinnis and you follow him on his journey it, it was actually like a precursor to, to that, um, you know, where, where you follow this character week in and week out, almost like the Incredible Hulk was, you know, when it came out in, what was that, 79, um, where you're following Bill Bixby when he goes from town to town and turns into the Hulk or whatever, you know, this was kind of that same format, the Fugitive, the Invaders, uh, the Incredible Hulk. And it was a very effective format and very interesting. I think the storylines were great. Uh, I want to thank all you guys for joining me today. The, um, you know, I know it's it's kind of like a post-holiday weekend. Uh, people probably have a lot of stuff going on. You know, you might have, uh, you know, football games you're watching today. So I really do appreciate you coming out and watching the live broadcast today. So I just want to shout out a couple of you guys here. Uh, we got Air Force Max. He came on first and commented. Hola and hello and hello. So welcome Air Force Max. Thanks for joining in. Uh, M9078JK3. I like the way the aliens burned up when I was a nine-year-old kid. Yeah. Yeah. I liked it too. I, I don't know if like is the right word, but yeah, it's kind of like, okay, here's the aliens trying to take over. You know, it's okay if you kill the aliens and, and they burn up. It was very effective at the time. I thought it was pretty neat and novel. Yep, I agree with you, M. And, and M9078 also says, it reminded me of the previous The Fugitive, also by Quinn Martin. Yes, exactly. Same format. 
Uh, same same type of storyline. James Rowland says, My wife did grow up with the invaders. A couple of years ago, I showed a couple of episodes and it really freaked her out. Well, you know, even if you watch it today and you can watch, there's some episodes that are available on YouTube. You can actually watch them for free. Uh, or there's a DVD set out, which, of course, I purchased a couple of years back and pull out every once in a while and, and catch up on some of the older episodes. It, uh, you know, it's really interesting, even today, I find. Uh, James Rowland, again, says, I remember Invaders comic books and a model kit of the alien ship. Yeah, yeah, there were different, uh, they, they had novels also about the, of the Invaders, which were pretty cool. I used to like to read the novels at the time. They would put out, you know, different series would have novels come out, not just Star Trek, but you had The Man from Uncle, James Bond, and, uh, and obviously Invaders. I, I'm not sure how many novels it lasted. It might have, I, I know at least it came out to like a number three. I'm not sure how much it lasted after the show went off the air. Stuart Abbott says, color TV was still, was new still. Can't believe they advised it was in color. Wow. Yeah, it was actually, ABC was the last, uh, the last network to go to all color, believe it or not, in 67. Almost every other show was in color by that point. In fact, I think every other show was in color at least, um, at least the network shows at that point uh, until 67. Stuart Abbott says color. Oh, I think I just read that one. John Jones, it's nice to put a face to the voice. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, you know, I, I'm a little camera shy, um, so it's taken me a while to get to do these live broadcasts. Uh, I'd like to do the research and really hone things down before I talk about a subject. I kind of want to know what I'm talking about. So it's been a little nerve wracking for me to do these live broadcasts, but, but I'm trying. I, in the future, I'd like to try to get on a regular, you know, a regular basis, say like every Sunday at one, something like that. Maybe even more often if, uh, if I have a subject to talk about um, and I get a little more comfortable with the camera. So we'll see what happens. <clears throat> Stuart Abbott says, I remember when Color TV came out, 65, 66. Yeah, I, you know, I believe I got my first Color TV. Actually, the Invaders, I remember seeing in black and white. You know, I, I know it was in color, but I, we didn't have a Color TV set until, I want to say, the late 60s when we bought one of those big old consoles. I think it was a Zenith console. You know, the ones where you've got like the record player in the top, you know, you 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 know put the lid up you can put the record on inside and it's got a little storage space and, and it also has uh has a tv in the front so yeah we had one of those and also we had um our black and white tv actually had a kind of remote control on it i don't i don't know if any of you guys had this or if you remember this but you know it wasn't a remote in the traditional sense like we think of it today uh, you know, it wasn't like you had a remote control and you pointed it at the TV and you hit the button and the channels turned. No, there was like a button on the TV. <laughs> so instead of reaching up and turning the knob, right, you hit the button and it goes click, 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 you know, to the next channel. So that was kind of a remote. I don't remember if we actually had a remote control. If we did, you know, maybe it was probably wired, but I just don't remember if anybody had one of those. Maybe you can tell me um, what exact how that exactly worked back then. So let me see. Mike uh, Michael Colette says I just saw one last night. It had the guy from Mission Impossible. Yeah, Peter Graves was on an episode. I really like to see him on the Invaders. They had quite a few uh, guest stars on there. Gene Hackman was on one of the episodes as well. Stephen Potts says I was too young when it was originally on. But I became a fan a few years ago, watching on it on MeTV. Yep, exactly. Uh, I get some of my information, some of my, you know, when I delve into trivia and facts, uh, I like to look at MeTV. I like to look at IMDb. I try to get all the trivia together that I possibly can and put it into a cohesive story about whatever TV show or movie that I'm talking about at the time. So that it kind of brings all the facts together for you guys. So you can kind of see them all in one, you know, in one place. 
I believe it was on MeTV. Yep. Captain Scamp says, what year were you born for perspective? Okay, so I was born in 1954, uh, January 21st, 1954. Um, yeah, I'm going to be celebrating my 69th birthday this coming January. So, you know, we're all getting up there. We all kind of, you know, we're all going to the same place eventually. So, but I really enjoy doing this. Uh, you know, I'm really into nostalgia. I'm into classic TV. Uh, I love watching classic shows. In fact, I'm watching a lot of the classic Doctor Who's now. That's another show that I'm really into. So even the ones from, you know, when it returned from 2005, you know, I, I love those as well. Practically anything science fiction oriented, I'll give a, I'll give a chance. You know, if it's good, I'll, I'll keep watching. If it's not, I'll turn it off. That's just, you know, that's how I roll. But, um, you know, I just, I'm been into this genre since since I was a kid and since I was watching things like like Superman reruns of Superman on Saturday mornings. And in fact, the invaders kind of became like a lifelong interest to me in UFOs, in the UFO phenomenon. Um, you know, I remember anything I could read about UFOs back when I was a kid, you know, any magazines, uh, there were magazines that would come out with with pictures of UFOs, you know, which probably most were fake. You know, but it didn't matter to me as a kid. I believed all that stuff. And I remember reading an article one time that told you how to build a UFO detector. <laughs> Believe it or not, I, I actually built a portable UFO detector. It never went off. But, you know, I remember seeing this picture of a UFO that, that kind of looked like it was a cloud. And I would always study the clouds to see, you know, is... is that cloud, does that look like a UFO? I'm not, I'm not sure. So what I did, it was basically just, you get, um, I think I got like a shoe box, some kind of cardboard box. And what you would do would be, you would have, you'd have like a, a, a bell connected to these wires that would come down the side and you, you would hang this magnet down the middle on a thread. And if a UFO, you know, supposedly, would go overhead, uh, it would trigger the magnet to go to the side. It wasn't on a thread. I guess it was on a wire. So the wire, you know, if it would connect to another wire on the side, it would set the alarm bell off. That's basically how it worked. It was very, very simple contraption. But I was convinced that I was going to see a, a UFO. And there were a few times where I think I did see a UFO. Not really sure, but I was convinced at the time that it was a UFO. In fact, you know, getting into that a little bit, um, my dad was really into UFOs, and he used to tell us a story. You know, I, I don't know how true it was, but I, I believed him. He was my dad, you know. I remember him telling me a story that he was, he was driving down the road, down the highway one night, one morning. It was still dark out. And he said that he saw this light behind him, and it was following him. And when he looked in the rearview mirror, it was like a disc-shaped light that uh, it just kind of flew up overhead and flew off into the sky. So that was my dad's UFO story. Uh, he stuck by it. And, uh, he, he seemed to believe it, so I believed it too. And, you know, that's basically my UFO connection. I, I loved anything to do with science fiction and UFOs and uh, also any kind of strange phenomenon as well. So, you know, Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, ESP, all that stuff. I really got sucked down the rabbit hole here, but uh, let me see where I was. Uh, James Rowland says, I was going on, I was nine going on 10 when the show aired and me and my friends imagined our teachers to be, to be the invaders. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Uh, they probably acted like invaders too, right? Mike Collette says, I remember those TVs. We had one of those. You're right. Click, click. I also had a small black and white portable. My dad spoiled my brothers a lot. We were the first kids in the neighborhood to have them. Yeah. You know, TVs weren't cheap back then. And, you know, most people only had one income. It just like mom stayed home, taking care of the kids, making dinner, keeping the house. 
dad went to work. You know, this is how, how it was mostly back in those days. I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong. I know today things are so expensive. You know, two people have to work to support a, to support a family. You know, I realize that. But back then, uh, you know, to buy a color TV was, was just out of most people's reach um, until they started coming down in price. In fact, the first color set I remember seeing was at my aunt's house. And it wasn't really color. Believe it or not, it was a black and white TV. And they had some kind of a screen, like a, a clear filter that went over the, the top of the tube, the picture tube. And it kind of gave like a fake color look. So it wasn't really color. It was just kind of like a fake color. That was my first impression of color TV. That had to be back in, I don't know, the early 60s, 63, maybe 64, or something like that. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm rambling on here. Let me, uh, let me get back to the comments. Uh, Stuart Abbott says, remember, red t-shirt on Star Trek means person going to die probably. Yeah, more than probably. <laughs> it was like almost every time I remember seeing a red shirt, that was, uh, you know, yeah, they're not going to last through this episode. Uh, let's see. So, 1958. James, James, you were born in 1958. So, yeah, you're you're a few years younger than I am, but you probably remember most of this stuff. You know, I, I'm sure you watched a lot of the same stuff I did, and a lot of it in reruns on Saturday morning, like Lost in Space. I don't remember watching a lot of it when it was on the air. I did watch some of it, but when it came on in syndication in the 70s. That's when I, I really started watching it. Every day it was on syndication. I think it was on like five or six o'clock, and you know, right around my dinner time, um, you know, during the, those years on syndication. And it was on five days a week. I'd watch every single episode multiple times. The Invaders, I, I'm not really sure I ever saw that in syndication. I, I saw it mostly on, you know, when it was in, in broadcast and then, uh, you know, I didn't watch it till later when I bought the DVDs, believe it or not. So there was a long time span there between when I first saw it. But it made such an impression on me that I never forgot it. And when I saw um, Dave, when I saw Roy Thinnis show up, I was about to call him David Vincent. When I saw Roy Thinnis show up on the X-Files, I was like, oh, this is great. And he still looked good at that time. It, it was like the early 90s. And... Uh, I don't know. He, he, you know, he aged, of course, but I think he was so young in the original series that by the time he was in the X Files, I guess he was in his, I don't know, late fifties, early sixties. I'm not exactly sure, but he looked pretty darn good at the time. I mean, he looked like him, you know, just a little, just older, and really played a great part in the X Files. If you ever get a chance to see those episodes um, where he actually plays an alien that. Uh, that has a healing power. It's pretty cool. I won't give anything away if you've never seen them, but, uh, you know, check on Google, do a search for, you know, Roy Thinnis X-Files. It'll give you the episodes he's in. I can't think of the, of the name he was like. I think it was Jeremiah Smith, something like that. Mike Collette says, 1961 for me. I'm in 71. I almost said you're 71. In 71, I thought I saw a UFO. Next morning, the radio was talking about several people seeing the UFO. Uh, that's really creepy, Michael. You know, there were a lot of UFO reports back then. And, and over the years, there's still UFO reports. And just recently, in the past couple of years, it, it's like they're coming out saying, yeah, they're real. We don't know what they are. You know, they're not like ridiculing people anymore, which, which is really odd because for all those years, they were just denying the whole phenomenon. And now suddenly, you know, there's uh, there's Air Force pilots coming out uh, talking about their sightings and showing video of their sightings. And, you know, it it's just really strange the way it's, you know, it's turned around. Um, you know, I'm not sure where it's going. There's still no proof of anything. Uh, it could just be technology of some kind, you know, secret technology. I, I don't know. I, you know, I hope we find out someday. William Welch says, I was born in 64, so I didn't see the show until years later. I've always been a fan of Roy because of his association with Jerry Anderson. 
Uh, yeah. What, what uh, William? What would? What did he actually do with Jerry Anderson? And you know, if you can, throw it in the comments uh, so I can check it out. Okay, M9078 says, my parents got a Magnavox color console in 1965. So, yeah, you were kind of ahead of the game getting the color console. What do you remember about it? Was the color decent, you know, when they first came out? Or, you know, it seems like they improved it a lot over the years. I don't know for a fact because I was a kid, so I didn't really pay that much attention to it. I still watched black and white and really enjoyed the stuff in black and white. You know, I was a big Twilight Zone fan, and still am a big Twilight Zone fan. All those were in black and white. That's fine with me. I can still watch them today and and still love them. Uh, Nico, uh, I don't want to, like, butcher that last name, but I'll take a shot. Kuiman says, best series ever. It was a great series, I, I have to say. Um, I love the Invaders. Danny in Asheville says, Hello, I am glad to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you here too, Danny. Is that Asheville, North Carolina by any chance? Danny says, The Invaders was good at the beginning, then not so great. Yeah, it kind of went downhill a little bit. You know, they the ratings started to dip, so they started to get into, you know, they had the group of believers and they, you know, it was less focus on the aliens and, and more on the characters. And they really got away from what was important to the invaders, which was what people were watching for. You're, you're watching for the invaders, the, the actual alien invasion. Michael Collette says, I guess I watched the reruns, but Lost in Space, Land of the Giants, Thunderbirds. How about Fireball XL5? That was one of my favorites. Fireball XL5. Steve Zodiac. I don't know. I think that was only on for a year either, but that really, you know, those puppets really creeped me out for some reason. There was one on a planet, and I think it was on like the moon or something, with a really creepy alien puppet that just like weirded me out. I, I don't even know what year it was. It might have been 63. I can't remember what year Fireball XL5 was on, but, uh, Rob Hawk says, Journey to the Far Side of the Sun. Yeah, that was a movie, right? Journey to the Far Side of the Sun. I'll have to check that out again. I seem to remember that. I remember the title of that. I don't remember much about it, though. M9078 says, The color was good, not great. We watched Batman in color on it. Oh, that's a plus, Batman in color. Uh, there was a lot of color in Batman. I think we had a color TV set by then. That was what, 66, I think, that 66 to 68? Something like that. You know, everybody was going to color by then. But you still had some shows that had, uh, I, like, the first season of, is it Gilligan's Island that was in black and white the first season? I think the, was the Beverly Hillbillies in black and white too? Yeah, I can't remember. The first season of Lost in Space was very good, Danny. Yep, I really enjoyed it. And Superman, yeah, Superman was filmed in color, except I think the first two seasons were in black and white. And then after that, it was in color. Even though I didn't see it in color at the time. When I was watching the reruns in syndication, I had a black and white set. But then later on, I got to see him in color. So I wanted to talk about some um, I want to talk about some different facts about the invaders that I pulled up. This is on MeTV. Well, one of the things I found fascinating was the music on the invaders it was actually written um, by Dominic Frontier, who also did the music on the Outer Limits. So it says here in the uh, in the episode "The Form of Things Unknown." which I actually haven't seen that episode in a long time. I should watch it again. But it says the music on The Invaders was from that episode of, of The Outer Limits. Uh, much of the score from the episode was utilized in The Invaders, right down the elements of the theme song. 
And that what a great theme song that was on the Invaders. It's just chilling. Dominic Frontier. Now, Roy Thinnes was also a rare actor that appeared in two of the longest-running network dramas. He was on Gunsmoke and Law and & Order. Now, he wasn't in all, you know, 20 seasons, but he appeared on each, each drama. Now, they do mention here that, that he later played a shape-shifting alien, oh, a shapeshifter abducted by aliens on the X-Files. It says here that uh, X-Files creator Chris Carter watched the invaders in his youth, and uh, the alien paranoia runs through both series, which it definitely does. Uh, Darren McGavin also popped up uh, in the X-Files. And, of course, uh, he was the star of Kolchak the Night Stalker, which, if you've never seen that, those first two movies, especially the first movie, was was great. Uh, the TV series, not so much. Now, apparently, the show is huge in France. For some reason, uh, the French have just taken to the invaders. The fandom is just out of control over in France. Interesting. Clarence Walker says, I remember this show from my childhood, along with other Quinn Martin shows. The man loved his Fords. <laughs> Roy says, Hi, I enjoy your shows. I was born in 1949. I got to see these shows from the start. Have you ever watched a show called Science Fiction Theater? That had some great stories. Yeah, Roy, if you take a look at uh, at my back catalog, you'll see I, I do have a video um, where I covered science fiction theater. I didn't watch it when it came on, obviously, but I have seen some shows after the fact, and there are some on YouTube, so you can still check some of the old ones out. YouTube is just such a treasure for these shows. You know, there, I'm working on a, a video right now of uh, of a really obscure cartoon from the early 60s. And guess what? They're on YouTube. So you'll be seeing that coming out in the next few days. Clarence Walker says, Roy Thinnes was in a film with Richard Roundtree called Charlie One-Eye. You know, I'm sure Roy appeared in a lot of things. I'm not exactly sure. Like, I, he had, had a very long career, and he was really popular in the 60s. He was in a, a soap opera where, where he was discovered for the invaders. But uh, after that, you know, I'm sure that Roy had a very long career. Was that a good movie, um, Charlie One-Eye? Michael Collette says The Outer Limits was great and The Twilight Zone. What about the show Fringe? Oh, tell me about Fringe. I love that show. I love the characters in that show. Yeah, that show is awesome. It ran for five seasons and... Uh, you know, it had that recurring thread that went through the whole series, which is kind of like the X-Files had that as well. You know, they had the, the shows that interconnected and then they did other standalone shows in between. But the uh, the storyline was really gripping in that. And the, and the actors, the characters were just brilliant, I thought. And the writing was above average, too. Kolchak movies were great, William. Yep, absolutely. I'd love those movies. And the, the first one, I watched that when it first came out. And, you know, it, it just, it really made you believe in vampires. It, you know, it, it was such a, I can't remember the actor's name now. You know, if you want to put that in the comments, let me know who it was. But whoever the actor was really played a frightening vampire. James Rowland says, I think the recent batch of UFOs cited by many Navy and Air Force pilots are DARPA projects meant to test their reaction. But who knows? Who knows is right. You know, uh, with when, you, when it comes to, like, conspiracy theories, you know, yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about, you know, how I feel about the subject now. Back when I was a kid, you know, I was fascinated by the subject of UFOs and abductions. There was, uh, there was the Barney and Betty Hill abduction case, which, 
you know, I read about that whole case. I read books that, that were coming out in UFOs, paperbacks. Um, was it the Georgia Damsky UFOs? And I kind of believed everything when I was a kid, you know, even grow, going into my 20s. I, I just, you know, I believed in all, all that stuff, psychic phenomenon and UFOs. And like I was saying before, Bigfoot, um, you know, all that psychic stuff. I believed in it. And I guess over the years, I've become cynical, you know, where, you know, OK, it's nice that you're coming out saying that these things are real, but. You know, how about some proof? You know, how about a really good photo of one of the UFOs? You know, it's still like these little dots, these little lights that are just kind of like, you know, zig zigzagging around in the sky. You know, we ha everybody has a camera now. You know, I realize that like these pilots aren't just up there holding the camera in their hands waiting for a UFO to come by. But you would think that with, with everybody having a camera now, there'd be better photographs. I, I don't know. Are they being repressed? I don't know. You know, I think the first thing I would, I would ask if I became the president, I'd say, okay, where's proof of the UFOs? I'm going to re release this to the public. Oh, no, you can't release it to the public, Mr. President. People would be scared. You know, don't you think people have a right to know? So that's what kind of makes me think that maybe... I don't know. You know, maybe there's no real solid proof. I'd like to believe that, yeah, a UFO landed in 1947 in Roswell, and and they have uh, pieces of the UFO somewhere in you know some army base somewhere, some Air Force base, uh, Area 51 or something. I, I'd like to believe that, but you know, maybe it's repressed. I don't know. Journey to the Far Side of the Sun was also called Doppelganger. You know, I'm going to have to check that out. And you, you really piqued my interest there, William. Clarence Walker says, if you're talking about the Night Stalker TV movie, which I was, the actor who played the vampire was Barry Atwater. Bing. Bingo. <laughs> Bing? <laughs> yes, Barry Atwater played the vampire. And wow, what a job he did. That was It was great. I should have said ding. Michael Collette says the most gripping cold track that freaked me out was Carl was facing a shapeshifter and the shapeshifter took the shape of his old lady friend. Yeah, I don't remember that one exactly, you know, but I've been meaning to go rewatch those. I actually have all those episodes uh, on digital, so I should go back and check them out. Maybe I'll do a video on, on cold track again. I did do a, a video on cold track previously. But I might need to dive a little bit more in depth into the TV series. I wanted to read a little bit of this article, too, that I found. Let me see if I can bring it up here. Okay, here we go. So this is an article from 2015. Uh, by a man named Ian C. Douglas. And it's about the invaders. And he says, uh, Forget Doctor Who or Star Trek. If you want to know the show that brought scares to the living room of TV audiences in the 60s, look for two simple words. The invaders. Now half forgotten, in its day the invaders was highly successful and innovative. Syndicated around the world and repeated endlessly, it had a guest list to die for. Gene Hackman, Roddy McDowell, Anne Francis, Burgess Meredith, and Michael Rennie were among a host of big names. Sure, today we can laugh at its dated effects and dodgy saucers, but at the time, it broke the mold and forged the path many would later follow. So with its 50th anniversary in 2016, let's look at why it was so special. Inspired by Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and drawing from all that Cold War paranoia, the invaders has a simple premise. The aliens are here, they look like us, and they are secretly working away on our destruction. Only one man, David Vincent, knows the truth, but he can't prove it. 
The aliens are damn clever at disposing of the evidence. Each week, Vincent risks his life thwarting some diabolical alien scheme while suffering ridicule, even aggression, from the locals who consider him a total wacko. What made it so scary and gripping? The Invaders is one of those rare, happy moments when everything came together. The show opens with a chilling voiceover, underscored by Dominic Frontier's theme music. Surely one of the most sinister tunes ever composed, guaranteed to send shivers down the necks of baby boomers, even today. I have to agree with that. And, and this article hits almost every point that I think about the show. Uh, you know, it, that it was just, I, I believe it was kind of ahead of its time, really. Um, but, I, you know, everything he's saying here is, is pretty much how I feel about the series. Back to the article, but that was only the rising curtain. On the whole, the scripts were finely crafted, fast-paced, with a touch of human interest. Broken marriages, failing careers, but none of that lovey-dovey romance that cropped up on the other shows. The emphasis was on gritty realism, nail-biting fight scenes, and the otherworldly weirdness. And the unhappy endings, audiences were denied the cozy triumphs seen on rival programs. The aliens' true shape and homeworld were never revealed, adding to the mystery, but they came with their own trademarks, every bit as unique as the Vulcan ears. There was the three ways to spot an alien. No pulse, no blood, and the foot soldiers had those crooked, picky, pinky fingers. <laughs> when watching the show, you scrutinize the hands of every extra to walk on the set fearful of who might be the next monster in disguise. Interestingly, Larry Cohen, the series co-creator, said of the stiff little fingers, and this is Larry Cohen talking. Uh, let me bring this up here. The extended pinky used to be a symbol of uh, effeminacy. Back in the 60s, the homosexual community were living secret lives. I thought, here are these aliens living among society keeping their true identity secret. And, and that's funny because the pinky symbolizes homosexuality and nobody will get the gag, but I'll put it in there anyway. That was in uh, Larry Cohen's own words. Also, when fatally wounded, the aliens incinerated, leaving nothing but a residue of ash. So no alien autopsies to give the game away. Yeah, I don't know if you guys ever saw that alien autopsy video from back, I don't know, what was it, about 20 years ago now, uh, that was supposedly real. I don't know, it, it was pretty creepy, I have to say, when I did watch it, it was pretty creepy. Also, when fatally wounded, the aliens incinerated, leaving nothing but a residue of ash. So no alien autopsies to give the game away. I just read that. A simple stop camera effect, then a red glow was added in post-production. Dated as it seems now, it was state-of-the-art back then and horrifying. The aliens' lasers did the same thing to unfortunate humans who got in the way. Clarence Walker says, Horror in the Heights was the Kolchak episode about the shapeshifter. Ruth McDevitt was the lady it impersonated. Horror in the Heights. Okay, I'm going to check that out. Thanks for that info, Clarence. William Welch says, Journey to the Far Side of the Sun is about an astronaut that takes off and then returns to Earth in an apparent failure. Turns out, he lands on a different Earth on the other side of the sun. Ooh, uh, that sounds really good. I'm going to have to check that out. M9078 says, great article. Yeah, this, was, this is an excellent article about the show. He really makes some excellent points here. Harold, Harold, blah, 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 getting a little dry here. Harold Trittner says, nothing beats Plan 9 from Outer Space. Oh, how I love this ma masterpiece. Plan 9 was uh, was certainly a masterpiece, uh, probably not in the way they anticipated. Clarence Walker says, let's not forget that The Invaders was created by the late Larry Cohen, who gave us Q, the Feathered Serpent. It's alive, the stuff and Black Caesar. 
All true. All true, Clarence. Sally Wagenblatt says Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1968 is the greatest alien invasion movie. Okay, Sally, I loved the 1978 Invasion of the Body Snatchers. But for me, the 1953 Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the black and white one, is the ultimate. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the one from 78. It, it truly... I. It truly is horrific with great performances all around and probably just as good as the original, you know, as the original movie. But there's just something about that one, that black and white invasion of the body snatchers um, that just really, I don't know, just really got me at the time and, and still does. I still watch it. I, I try to watch that movie once a year because it, it just, it creeps me out every time I watch it. Robert Hayes says the special effects still stand up for the time they were done. I'm sure if they restored the series like they did with Star Trek TOS, I'm sure it would look awesome. I agree, Robert. I think for the time, the, the, uh, the special effects were great. Uh, getting back to the article... He says, the scariest thing of all was the fact that they looked like us, but weren't. Emotionless, brutal, always two steps ahead of the hero. These aliens were the real deal. Some of the most unnerving scenes involve a human suddenly finding himself surrounded. Invariably hulking men, the aliens act with one mind to cut off the victim's escape. A look of horror dawns on the victim's face as he realizes not only do the aliens exist, but they're going to kill him right from the first episode, right when they, they take David Vincent's friend that, that comes out to help him. Often the humans offer no resistance or the merest token overwhelmed by the terrible knowledge that they're outnumbered and therefore powerless. A Freudian psychologist might say this speaks to our darkest fears of the power of the crowd over the individual. Anything from lynch mobs to gang rape, and that's why these scenes are so disturbing. Perhaps the most outstanding feature is the hero. Architect David Vincent's life is ruined by the alien conspiracy. When aliens are not trying to kill him, the public are mocking and humiliating him. His journey is a lonely path, and he often appears bitter and twisted. Even his surname seems a reference to another famous loner, Van Gogh. But he's a lot more than that. Compare him to the heroes of other contemporary sci-fi shows. Captain Kirk and Agent James West both had an eye for pretty girls, always dabbling in romantic intrigues. Vincent, on the other hand, rejects the passes by lonely housewives made at him. He's clearly repulsed when a shapely female alien professes feelings for him. While honor-bound to save damsels in distress, at the end of each episode, he drives into a lonesome sunset. From a 21st century perspective, it's hard not to wonder if he's secretly gay. Now, that's what the author says here. But, uh, you know, it kind of reminds me of, again, The Incredible Hulk or The Fugitive, where at the end, they go off on their own, uh, either, you know, looking for a cure in The Incredible Hulk's case looking for the one-armed man in the fugitive's case, or looking for the aliens in the invader's case. But Vincent, he's also a jerk, ruthless in his mission to prove aliens are among us. Half the people who help him end up dead. <laughs> he's quite happy to place civilians in harm's way, and even tricks aliens into killing a human collaborator. Well, we said he was twisted. Perhaps that's what being a pariah does to you. Roy Thinnes' portrayal of David Vincent is one of the great acting jobs in sci-fi telly history. He brings more to the role than pretty boy looks. Thinnes could convey the desperation, the bitterness, the anger, the determination with a single look. You didn't much like him, but you were still rooting for him. Thinnes made the character's knack of persuading ordinary people to risk their lives believable. Vincent was an anti-hero and Thinnes captured that brilliantly. 
Despite all the roles Thinnis has done since, he will be remembered as that lonely architect. Cast and crew of the Invaders were disappointed when it was canceled after its second season. But in hindsight, that saved it. Instead of a terminal decline into silliness, the Invaders left us with a collection of stomach-churning, edge-of-the-seat storylines. The show is a polished gem, still shining brightly today. So, I'm not sure I totally agree with that assessment, Ian. But I agree with about 95% of what you say in that article. The Invaders, I still think it was a great show with, uh, with special effects that were, you know, maybe, maybe they're somewhat dated. But some of the shots I still find were, were still, uh, still hold up somewhat to this day. And, and again, I believe it's the storyline that really elevates a show above all else. And for me, the Invaders had great compelling storylines that really made you want to keep watching. You know, a lot of the stuff that I watch today, I get about halfway through and I'm wondering why, why am I still watching this? And I click the off button and go to something else. So, I mean, maybe it's just me, maybe, you know, maybe I don't have the, you know, maybe I, you know, I don't have the attention span anymore to watch some of these longer programs. But, but if something, to me, if something doesn't grip me in the first 10 minutes, I'm out of there. You know, it, it's like I'm wasting my time. I get bored. So I don't know about you guys. Let me know what you think in the, in the comments. But, you know, that's just how I'm feeling. So let me read a few more of these comments, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of here for the rest of the day and um, go work on the next video that I'm working on right now. So... You'll be seeing something probably by the end of the week. Robert Hayes says the special effects still stand up for the time they were done. I'm sure if they restored the series like they did with Star Trek TOS, I'm sure it would look awesome. I might have already read that one, but I totally agree with you, Robert. I wish they would redo it like they did TOS. John Jones says I'm really enjoying this live interaction. Would love for this to be a recurring thing. Thanks, John. I'm really going to try to do this every Sunday at one o'clock, um, you know, as long as I have something to talk about. So you guys are always welcome to to send me a message, uh, DM me at my uh, at my email address uh, or put it put something in the comments below and um, request something, request something that you want me to talk about. Or that you guys want to talk about. I mean, that's mainly it. It's more like. What do you guys want to see? What do you want to see me cover uh, besides these live shows? What what are there any like classic TV shows that you really would like to see me cover? Um, leave it in the comments. You know, I, I read everything. And if I see something that really piques my interest, I'll get right to work on it. I'm a one man show here. I do all the research. I do the voiceovers. I do the editing. You know, the video editing is not the greatest. I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert video editor by any means. I do the best I can, but I really like to, to just focus on everything and get it just the way I want it. You know, um, I don't put something out unless it's as researched as I can, as I, as researched as I can get it, let me say. So William Welch says, got to go, but thanks for your videos. Don't forget to give a thumbs up to everyone. For sure, William. Thanks for stopping in. Really appreciate you coming by. Really appreciate you coming by. I'm starting to get too dry to talk here. John Gormley says, "Love that show." Thanks. You're welcome, John. James Rowland says, "I do not think Vincent was gay. He was totally focused on battling invaders." Th that's where I agree with you. I, I I don't agree with everything Ian said in that article, although it was a very good article, very well done. But uh, but I agree. He was totally focused on finding the invaders and revealing their existence to the world. That's how I viewed it. There was no time for love, rest, etc. He was in a sense like Gilgamesh, Trent in the Outer Limits. Yep, for sure, Trent in the Outer Limits, which that's another one of my favorite top five Outer Limits episodes. 
demon with a glass hand. What a great episode. There were, you know, I don't want to like go down another rabbit hole here talking about the outer limits. We'll get to more of that in another video. But for now, guys, thanks everyone for stopping by. Thumbs up to everybody that's come by and watched this live stream. Uh, come by every Sunday at one o'clock. I'm going to put something together. Even if I just, you know, come on and, and we just talk old classic movies and classic TV without, without a definite uh, topic in mind, I'll be happy to come on and hang out with you guys. So thanks for hanging out with me. And uh, I guess that's going to end it for this live stream. I appreciate you all coming out. And uh, this is Rich. If you haven't yet, or if you're new here, make sure to hit that subscribe button below. I'm getting close to 100,000 subscribers. I'd like to try to reach that. And with your help, I will. And I really appreciate all your support. So with that in mind, I'll see you next time. I'll see you next Sunday at 1. And I'll see you in my future videos. Thanks a lot for stopping by, and, and I'll see you again.